Hello, welcome to another episode of the DRH show. As usual, in each episode, I'll be talking to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well being. Today, I'm joined by an evolutionary psychologist, author, and host of The Sad Truth, Dr. Gad Sad. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Good to meet you. It's great to have you here, Dr. Saad, and a lot of people who would be watching this would surely know about you, but for the benefit of those who haven't come across your work, can you um, tell us your backstory, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing? Uh, I was born in Lebanon. We're a family of Lebanese Jews. We escaped the Lebanese Civil War in the mid-70s because it was no longer advisable to be Jewish in Lebanon. We moved to Canada, where I grew up starting from the age of 11. I did some of my education in Canada, then I went on to the US where I studied uh, psychology of decision making. Uh, and th it's there that I first was bitten by the evolution bug. I had taken a course, an advanced social psychology course, where the professor, uh, you know, maybe halfway through the semester, assigned a book by two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology. The book was titled Homicide where they looked at patterns of criminality from an evolutionary perspective. And since I was interested in studying uh, consumer decision-making, uh, I had my epiphany. I would then go on to apply evolutionary psychology to study human behavior in general and consumer behavior in particular. So that's sort of the quick elevator story of my scientific career. But then I also put on a second hat as a academic and public intellectual, and that is I battle poor decision-making, not just for consumers, but poor decision-making wherever I can find it. And so I just wrote a book that was just recently released titled The Parasitic Mind, where I discuss how idea pathogens, so akin to how you can have a parasite that can take hold of an organism's brain and cause it to behave maladaptively, I argue that idea pathogens, all of which were spawned within the university ecosystem, can cause people to engage in disordered thinking and maladaptive behavior and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you, of course, you just mentioned about your book and um, you, you mentioned that um, the, the title is very catchy, how infectious ideas are killing common sense. And you give us a quick snapshot of what your book is all about. But is this somehow inspired by COVID-19? It or wasn't. It just, it just happened that the two pandemics kind of collided. But mm -hmm. as I often say, not really jokingly, that whereas the COVID pandemic is something that we've been dealing with since, you know, maybe last uh, winter, this, this global pandemic of the human mind has been something that, you know, I've been warning against and a few others have from within the halls of academia for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, I mean, I haven't been warning about it for 40 years. I would have been a very young child then. But certainly in my time as a professor, I've been a professor now for 26 years, I have seen the uh, never-ending war on reason, you know, unfold before my eyes. And so I always tell people that I have faced two great wars in my life. The first one I mentioned earlier, which is the Lebanese Civil War from which we escaped, and the second one, much later, the war on university campuses against science, logic, reason, common sense. And w would you um, give us an example of these sure. infectious ideas, ideas pathogens, and how did they came about? You mentioned that they've been, um, you know, um, in existence for a number of years, but how did they came about? So all of the idea pathogens, and I'll give a few in a, examples in a second, all of them start off with a kernel of truth and they start off with some, you know, apparently noble cause, but then in the pursuit of that noble cause, the idea pathogen ends up murdering and raping truth, which is never a good idea. So in other words, we should be able to pursue noble causes without ever seeding a millimeter of the truth in doing so. So let me give you some specific examples. So postmodernism might be the granddaddy of all idea pathogens because it argues that there are no objective truths, everything, we are completely shackled by subjectivity, we are completely shackled by our personal biases. So you might imagine how there is a kernel of truth, truth to that. I mean, yes, the world is not uh, always free of subjectivity, but scientists do wake up every day under the working assumption uh, that there are statistical regularities to be uncovered, that there are truths to be discovered. Now, of course, in science, we talk about provisional truth. What was true 
300 years ago in science might no longer be true today, but we do operate with the understanding that there are objective truths. Uh, for example, in math, there are axiomatic truths. In, in life, there are empirical truths. And so the idea that you can espouse for 30, 40, 50 years in the halls of the humanities and the social sciences, that there is no such thing as truth, uh, there's only my truth, is a, is a form of intellectual terrorism. So that would be sort of a grand epistemological idea pathogen. But let me give you maybe one or two other specific ones. And then if we want to discuss other ones, we can certainly do so. Militant feminism is another idea pathogen. It starts off with a very good you know, uh, goal, which, which is equity feminism. Equity feminism argues that men and women should be equal under the law. There should be no institutionalized sexism against women. Of course, most people who are sane would say, yes, of course, sign me up. I'm an equity feminist. The problem then becomes when that original laudable goal metamorphosizes into in the pursuit of that noble objective, we must now create a reality whereby men and women are indistinguishable from each other, whereby we reject innate sex differences, whereby we argue that everything is due to a social construction. By the way, social constructivism would be another idea pathogen. Biophobia, the fear of using biology to explain human behavior would be another idea pathogen. So what ends up happening is you have all of these dreadful ideas not one of which can bring down the edifice of reason, but when you put all of these idea pathogens together, we end up with the type of lunacy that we see today. And I, I from my understanding is that this idea pathogen that you, you mentioned, um, this originates from universities. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but um, wh why, would you, why would it come from a place such as universities or mainstream media when supposedly there would be you know, a, a place for reasoning and reality? Yeah. That's a great question. Well, the, the, the sort of the, the, the facetious response to your question, although it's a, it's a correct response, is that it takes intellectuals to come up with some of the truly supremely dumb ideas. Now, I say that it, it seems as though I'm joking, but I'm not. Because what ends up happening in academia is you have a lot of professors who are completely decoupled from the consequences of their stupidity, right? So you don't see a lot of these idea pathogens in the business school. You don't see a lot of these idea pathogens in the engineering school. Why? Because there are metrics that will judge whether your ideas are worthy or not. If you're trying to model consumer behavior and you're using nonsense and you fail in your ability to predict consumer behavior, you're not going to last long as a mathematical modeler of consumer choice. If you're building bridges and you're using postmodernist physics to build the bridge, it's going to collapse. It's not going to go well. But if you are in the highfalutin ivory tower world of some of the humanities and some of the social sciences, by the way, I don't mean to imply that the social sciences and the humanities are nonsense. What I'm implying is that some of the professors within those disciplines will pontificate from their ivory tower perfectly decoupled from the consequences of their imbecilic ideas. And so this is why you end up with terrible ideas that come out of academia, because there isn't a corrective feedback loop. I can pontificate about nonsense and nobody challenges me. And if anything, I get rewarded. I get tenure, I get promoted, and uh, I pollute the minds of many generations of students in the pursuit of that nonsense. Uh, you, you mentioned something about being rewarded and I kind of re um, try to link that with um, social media because in a way when you try to pontificate on social media you get rewarded as well with likes and retweets. <laughs> so what, what so, um, well, I want to ask you Dr. Salis, how do you think the social media has contributed to the spread of these um, infectious ideas, um, especially in Twitter? Well. The reality is that all of these social media platforms are just a tool for the propagation of ideas, right? In a sense, the medium doesn't care whether the idea is a good one or a bad one. It's also social media that has allowed me to have a much larger platform than I would have otherwise had if I were only publishing papers in peer-reviewed journals. Now, of course, peer-reviewed scientific journals is, is great, and I'm, I hope to do that forever. But the reality is if a paper, if a scientific paper is cited a hundred times, uh, after 10 years, you're very excited because you, that paper is considered to be a very important paper. Whereas I could put out a tweet that says something reasonably important, if not quite important, and it could be uh, you know, read by 100,000 people. So, so I don't think that social media per se is responsible for the 
uh, propagation of bad ideas because we also have the capacity to defeat those ideas through social media. I think what social media does is it simply accelerates the velocity at which information flows, right? It, it might take me two, three, four years before a paper that I originally submitted to a journal is accepted and published, whereas I could open up my uh, laptop, put out a lecture for 30 minutes, and by the next morning, you know, 15,000 people have watched my lecture. So, so I think I don't want to demonize social media. Yes, there's a lot of ugliness on social media, but there's also wonderful opportunities to spread good ideas. And speaking of social media, of course, for those who are following you on Twitter, they would see how very, shall we say, very um, assertive or indignant you are with um, what you believe in. So wh where do you find the courage to fight? Yeah, th thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I always tell people that I have a very exacting uh, standard of personal conduct. So what I mean by that is when I'm about to put my head on my pillow to go to sleep, whether I have insomnia or not will depend on whether I feel that I that I lived the true life that day. And what do I mean by that? That I, however small my influence is or however big my influence is, I never shied away from protecting the truth. In a sense, I'm not in a sense, I am a, a truth purist. I despise attacks on truth. So it's akin to if you are walking down the street and you see from it, you hear that in an alley, some woman is being attacked by two people. You could be one of two persons. You could either ignore her cries and say, you know, I don't want to get involved. Or you could say, I'm the guy who's going to intervene and try to help this poor lady out. And so in a sense, I'm the guy who's walking by all the alleys where, you know, truth is being raped and murdered. And I just can't help but be indignant because I can't live my life any other way. I really get upset when I see attacks on truth. Now, again, this might sound as though I'm being dogmatic, but, you know, who are you to say what is true? Uh, no, there are truths that we can all agree with. Uh, to state that boys, too, can menstruate is not a truth, right? I could be, I could be a strong supporter of transgender rights, as I am, right? I'm, I'm about as socially liberal as you can get, but I don't think that we should be teaching children that sometimes, bo sometimes men give, ch uh, give birth and sometimes women give birth. So, in other words... I never have to lose my commitment to truth in the pursuit of a better society. Now, of course, as an academic, I'm sure you've heard about um, that, that there's a voice within the academic community that says that most studies are based on Western culture. And um, I'm based in the UK. And at one point, the BPS published an article. They said that um, psychology is overwhelmingly um, involved with participants, and by that they mean Western, educated, um, industrious, rich and democratic. So what do you make of that as an academic? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, one of the co-authors of the famous WEIRD paper, which is published in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, is actually a friend of mine, Joe Henrik, who's been on my show. As an evolutionary psychologist, in a sense, we are a lot less likely to succumb to the weird uh, sampling bias. Because if we truly wish to establish that something is a human universal, we typically don't just run a study with undergrads at Ohio State and then mic drop, good night everybody. We actually have to go and collect data from 50 different cultures that vary in every possible way before we say, look, it really does look that women prefer this type of man Men prefer this type of women. So if you think about the classic studies of, say, David Buss, one of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, uh, when he was developing his uh, you know, empirical findings about universal uh, mating preferences, he didn't rely on a, you know, uh, undergraduates at uh, University of Michigan or wherever he was at the time. He, he actually collected data from an astonishing number of societies. So so yes, I think the weird bias is a problem in many cases, but I certainly think that evolutionary psychology protects against the likelihood of succumbing to the weird bias. Now, um, talking about that interesting acronym, I've also come across with an acronym um, from you. Um, it's DIE, religion, it's diversity, inclusion, and equity. Now, for those who hasn't heard of that lovely acronym, can you talk us through about what exactly is DIE religion? Sure, I, I love the segue from one acronym to the other. Uh, well, 
So it's actually one of the idea pathogens. It comes from identity politics, one of the idea pathogens in the parasitic mind. Uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity is the idea that uh, we need to create uh, a way by which everybody is an equal participant in an endeavor. The problem with that is that it conflates equality of opportunities with equality of outcomes. So equality of opportunities is something that we should fight for. There is no reason why if you are of a particular category, you shouldn't have equal chance to participate, say, in science. Okay, And if there are institutional barriers stopping you from that, then we have to eradicate that. But that's not what happens with the Thai religion. The Thai religion says we have to have equality of outcomes. Oh, Stanford in their math department doesn't have the requisite black professor as a full professor. Aha, it must be due to racism. And therefore, we must institute policies to have more black mathematicians. That is a foundational attack on one of the principles of a enlightened society, which is you put individual dignity at the forefront of how you organize society instead of tribal allegiance or identity politics. And by the way, to go back to what we mentioned earlier, when you asked me to mention what my personal history was, mm -hmm. I come from the epitome of a society that is uh, organized according to identity politics, right? Lebanon is exactly what happens when every single interaction in society is viewed through the prism of identity politics. In this case, it's religious identity. Even the constitution of Lebanon says that the president has to be of this religion and the prime minister has to be of that religion and this number of people have to be of this religion when they sit in parliament and so on. And of course, what ends up happening is at some point, all of these endless you know, battles between identities break out into the violence that we saw in Lebanon. So imagine how disheartening it is for me to see that this exact reflex of always viewing people, not as individuals, but as foremost members of particular tribes is now defining how we hire people in organizations, how we promote people in universities, how we give grants in science. The Democratic Party in the US is completely enshrined within identity politics. So for someone with my personal history, it's terribly disheartening to see that we are now pledging allegiance to the Thai religion. It's grotesque. Mm -hmm. But some people would argue that um, identity is really an important component of you know, um, someone's um, behavior, someone's personality. So we can't really disentangle them. So what would you say to that? Um, say, for instance, in psychology, there's already um, a famous phrase that's been widely used now, live experience. So um, I'm pretty sure that in evolutionary psychology, it's very rare that you would use that. But um, what, what would you say to those people? Look, your identity, look, my being a, a Lebanese Jew is part of my identity. My being a dad is part of my identity. My being a husband to my wife is part of my identity. So nobody is questioning that our personhood is comprised of multiple markers of our identity. But that doesn't mean, though, that we decide who wins the 100-meter dash as a by celebrating your unique identity. I don't care if you're transgender. If you cross the 100 meters first, you get the gold medal. We don't decide who wins the World Cup in soccer based on, but it's not fair. No African country has never won it. Therefore, it must be racism. Life is a meritocratic, if it's a fair life, it's, a, it's based on meritocracy, right? Life is hierarchical. Life is competitive. We're not social ants. E.O. Wilson, the famous Harvard biologist and Harvard entomologist, when referring to communism and socialism, he and he studies social ants, he said, communism, socialism, great idea, wrong species. Meaning what? Social ants are not hierarchical. Everybody is equal, and there's only one, one entity that is above everybody else, and that's the queen that takes care of reproduction. Otherwise, everybody else is equal. Well, that's what communism is. We should all be equal, but we're not all equal. Some of us are smarter. Some of us are dumber. Some of us work harder. Some of us don't work as hard. So, yes, celebrate your identity. Be proud of your identity. Hurrah for your identity. But I don't want your identity to decide whether you get a distinguished professorship. I want your merit to decide that. Surely that's something that we could all agree on. 
Now, Dr. Said, you already mentioned like some instances how identity politics um, has spread um, from academia into sports and into business. Do you think that liberal democracies can survive identity politics? Uh, no. Now, it might take 50 years, 100 years, 500 mm. years. In other words, we won't necessarily have a repeat of Lebanon tomorrow. But if you keep enshrining tribalism as the way by which we interact with each other, there's only one outcome, and that is it'll be the collapse of our great societies. What, what makes our societies great is that they have a protective belt of foundational values mm -hmm. that are truly unique in the human experience. Most people who have were born in the West don't realize that the rest of humanity, let alone the rest of human history, was not defined by what we see in the West. The West is really an incredibly brilliant anomaly because, as I said, it has found a way to create a protective belt of values that has allowed us maximal flourishing. And to see now the eradication of these protective values is terrible for someone like me because, again, I didn't come from the West and therefore I see what's out there and it's it's the West, the West is the place where guys like me have to run to when we can no longer survive in our societies. And so I fear for the West. So when I say that we are approaching the abyss of infinite lunacy, I'm not being hyperbolic. Now, I'm not suggesting that doomsday is gonna happen tomorrow, but if we keep uh, slowly uh, you know, eradicating all of these values, it won't end well for our children or our grandchildren. Um, you, you're very vocal about um, your um, dislike about um, social justice. Do you ever get bored about talking, you know, talking about social justice? Uh, I mean, I, it's not so much I get bored. I get, you mentioned the word earlier and it's exactly the one that I use. I get indignant because <laughs> uh, I sometimes have, you know, theory of mind is something that we all should have. Theory of mind is the cognitive process by which I'm able to put myself in your mindset to be able to better interact with you. So for example, autistic children don't exhibit theory of mind. Uh, so theory of mind is a central cognitive ability that you know well-functioning humans should have. And so oftentimes I feel as though I'm unable to put myself in the mind of some of the positions taken by social justice warriors because I can't understand how someone could be so removed from common sense and reality. So for example, when Julian, and not, not to you know, harbor on the transgender issue, that, as I mentioned, my, my book is about a, a whole bunch of idea passages. Mm -hmm. but when Julian Castro, who was one of the people running for the democratic uh, you know, presidential position, uh, was talking about abortion, and then he had to apologize because he had insinuated that only women can have abortions, whereas now he knows that sometimes men have abortions and sometimes women have abortions. That's not really a good thing to do, right? It's not good that we are altering our understanding of folk psychology, whereby we need to now apologize when we say that when we talk about abortions, we're talking about biological females. That's not a good thing. And again, I say this as someone who is a very, very strong vocal supporter of not only transgender rights, the rights of anybody who is facing injustice, right? As a matter of fact, I get death threats for supporting the rights of women in the Middle East. So I walk the walk and I talk the talk. But again, it's it's not so much that I get bored about talking about social justice, is that I'm I'm angry that we actually have to have these conversations. I'm upset that I have to appear in front of the Canadian Senate in 2017 to explain to the Canadian senators that no, no, please trust me, as a professor and an evolutionary psychologist, there really is such a thing as male and female. Really? You need a professor in the 21st century to confirm that for you? So this is why I keep battling this, because I see the slippery slope and it's not pretty. And I suppose that your anger has prompted you to come up with some solutions. Um, did, did you mention any solutions on how to address social justice on your book? Yeah, so uh, I'll give, if I if we have a bit, I guess we have a few more minutes, I'll give you a slightly longer answer and, a, and then a shorter answer. So in chapter seven of The Parasitic Mind, I talk about how to seek truth, how to uh, how do we know if a position is, is, is veridical or not? And here, let me step back and explain what Charles Darwin did. So when Charles Darwin was trying to prove his theory of natural selection, uh, which resulted in him publishing uh, On the Origin of Species in 1859, 
He didn't collect data, as I mentioned earlier, from 30 undergrads at Ohio State University. He collected data over several decades from many, many different disciplines, from geology, from paleontology, from biodiversity, from comparative morphology, from animal husbandry, which when he put all this data together, it became incontrovertible that his theory was correct. Well, I argue that we have to use this type of epistemological thinking when we are debating about issues of substance. And so let me give you a concrete example. Let's suppose I wanna prove to you that toy preferences are not socially constructed. So uh, the fact that little boys are more likely to prefer trucks and little girls are more likely to prefer to play with dolls is not because they have sexist parents who teach them arbitrary gender roles, which is one of the idea pathogens that I discuss in the book, social constructivism, but rather there are some biological signatures behind those toy preferences. How would I go about demonstrating that to you? Well, I would build for you a nomological network of cumulative evidence. I won't do the whole network, but I'll give you a few of these distinct lines of evidence. Well, I could show you that children who are too young to have been socialized, they're, they're, they're not, they haven't yet reached the cognitive developmental stage to be socialized. They already exhibit those sex-specific toy preferences. That already casts doubt on the premise that is due to social construction. I could get you other animals, vervet monkeys, rhesus monkeys, chimpanzees, and show you that the infants within those species exhibit the same sex-specific preferences as humans. My God, that's looking pretty compelling, but I'm not finished. I could bring you data from pediatric endocrinology. What is that? Well, there are little girls who suffer from a disorder called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a disorder that masculinizes the behavior of little girls. Well, little girls who suffer from this disorder are more likely to have toy preferences that are the same as those of boys. So look, bit by bit, I'm bringing you data from a wide range of disciplines across time periods, across cultures, across disciplines, all of which are pointing to the same conclusion. And so I argue that when we're having important debates, we have to be this disciplined in our thinking. For example, if you were to ask me now, hey, Dr. Saad, what's your position on the legalization of marijuana? Well, I would have complete epistemic humility and say, you know what? That's a great question. And I simply don't know enough about it. I haven't built the requisite nomological network to be able to answer you that with full assuredness. So long-winded question, answer. Don't let emotional hysteria drive your positions. Be cognitively disciplined. So that's one. And then in chapter eight, I offer some, you know, call to actions as to how people can fight these idea pathogens. Maybe I'll just mention one and then, you know, people can hopefully read the others in the book. Mm -hmm. so I talk about activate your inner honey badger. What does that mean? A honey badger is an extraordinarily fierce animal. It's the size of a small dog, yet you can have six adult lions approach it and yet they will run away. How, how is that possible? Well, because they're so intimidated by its ferocity that they say, you know what? I don't, want, I don't want any part of this guy. He's too much. Well, I suggest that people have to have that ideological fierceness. So when I say activate your inner honey badger, what I mean is don't be cowed into silence. You asked me earlier, where do I get the courage to do what I do? Because I am the king of honey badgers. Mm -hmm. If you're going to come after me, you better be ready because I'm coming after you. I'm coming after your ancestors. I'm coming after your dead ancestors. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that in a violent way. What I mean is if I truly believe in my principles and I could defend them and I could articulate why I, why I believe them, then I never back away from a debate. I'm always ready for the next uh, I, you know, debate of, you know, intellectual debate. The problem is that most people don't have that ferocity. Most people, if you go boo, they go hide in a corner in a fetal position. And they always have some, quote, reasonable excuse why they don't want to get engaged in the battle of ideas. Well, I'm afraid I'll lose his friendship. Well, who am I to judge? Well, I'm afraid for my job. Well, my, my child will be punished by the principal if I speak out. So there's always some, quote, valid reason why they should not take up the mantle and fight. No. It's trench warfare. It's ideological warfare. If somebody says something on Facebook that you disagree with, 
challenge them politely. If you're at a pub and somebody says something that you think is insane, debate them. In other words, don't subcontract your voice to a few people who are willing to, you know, hold the, the weight of truth on their shoulder. We all have a voice. Activate your inner honey badger. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here. Um, I think you, you're you in a good position to, you know, say that we have to activate honey badger because, you know, a lot of people will be reluctant to exercise that because, um, say, for instance, in social media, I can't really retweet God said, um, I can't even like his tweet because, you, you, you know, like, because um, you've got tenureship, I would imagine you're, you're a professor, but it's diff different for people in academia or any, any other industry. They have to be protective of, of you know their their work uh, the tenure protect me when i was receiving more death threats than you have hair on your head the tenure protect me when i had to walk into the university protected by security where i would almost have an anxiety attack so i can lecture the tenure protect me when i had to file on the advice of my university a report with the montreal police because of the death threats so the idea that tenure is somehow some magical robe that protects me from all consequences is, forgive me for saying, complete nonsense. I've lost many professional opportunities because of my outspokenness. If, if you think it's tough to speak out when you are a, a journalist or if you're in, in a company, I'm within the ecosystem that created all those idiotic ideas. So if you think that I don't get punished, now sure, it's harder to fire me because I have tenure. That doesn't mean that I don't suffer unbelievable consequences. Do you think I get invited to the cool kids' parties in academia because of how I speak? Now, of course, all of those folks will write to me private emails, all those famous professors, and say, oh, Dr. Saad, you're, or Gad, if they know me, why, God, you're my hero. You're keeping me sane. But shh, please don't tell anybody that I support you. What is it that you're afraid of? You're afraid that I fight for women's rights in the Middle East? You're afraid that I fight for freedom of speech? Every single classical liberal idea that you supposedly are in, in support of is exactly what I fight about. But this is the inversion of reality that today we face. I am the heretic because I operate in an ecosystem of lunacy. Uh, so, so no, it is not true that tenure somehow protects me. By the way, I should mention this. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people who landed on Normandy, the young men uh, mm -hmm. who landed on Normandy, they knew that they were going to be mowed down by the German machine guns uh, like little mosquitoes. And yet they did what they did so that you and I can sit today in free societies and have this wonderful conversation. So whatever your fear is, it's not as big as the fear that they must have felt when they landed on Normandy or the fear that I felt when I didn't know whether I was going to live to the next day in Lebanon. And so, yes, I understand. Don't be an unnecessary martyr. Calculate when you want to speak out. But you certainly can't keep saying, I'm not going to speak because, bruh, I don't have tenure. That's a coward. Thank, thank you for um, um, make, making us realize about um, about that. Now, um, you explained to me earlier why, where your courage is coming from. Um, I just want to understand more um, um, if there is any particular individual or a particular piece of work who has the greatest influence to your line of thinking or to what you do as an evolutionary psychologist. Who, who has the greatest influence to you? I mean, not so not in terms of what led me to be courageous. What led me to be to have the courage that I have is the unique combination of my genes, right? Mm -hmm. I am who I am. It's not that I'm Lebanese Jewish. I am God sad, and therefore, maybe it's my testosterone level. Maybe, who knows what it is? Uh, but if you're asking me what are some books that have shaped my intellectual trajectory, is that? Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. So I would probably say originally that the book that I mentioned uh, at the start of our conversation, Homicide by Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, is the book that first exposed me to evolutionary psychology. So that would definitely be up there because it really was the epiphany. Seeing the elegance, the theoretical elegance with which evolutionary psychology could explain these uh, unbelievable phenomena, in this case, criminal behavior, was a real eye opener for me. So I think from an, for my for my scientific work, I would say that book. Although there have been many other books, that would probably be the top book. Uh, in terms of my uh, battles against all of the lunacy, 
there's a, an unbelievable book by uh, Paul Gross and uh, Norman Levitt, I think it's Gross and Levitt, called Higher Superstition. This was written probably around the mid 90s. Uh, one of them is a biologist, the other one uh, is a mathematician, and they were documenting some of the astonishing lunacy that was already taking uh, a hold of the university ecosystem. So for example, the field of feminist mathematics. I mean, that's insane, right? Mathematics is by definition, the field where your identity does not matter. I mean, the scientific method already does that, but you could argue, but you know, scientists could, could have their ideological biases. Math by definition removes that. The distribution of prime numbers is the distribution of prime numbers, whether I'm transgender or not, whether I'm Lebanese Jew or not. Prime numbers don't care about your gender identity. And yet there is a field called feminist mathematics. There's a field called feminist glaciology. I didn't know that studying ice was patriarchal. But so these guys 25 years ago were already reporting on the lunacy. And when I read that book, I said, oh my goodness, this is a battle that I want to be involved in. So I would say evolutionary psychology, it would be homicide, all the culture war, it would be higher superstition. I've never heard of that field, um, feminist mathematics, and I think that's something to be explored. Um, now, Dr. Sad, um, you've been working for a number of years um, in the field of evolutionary psychology, so you would have come across with different you know, misconceptions about um, that field. So I suppose if you could just um, mention some um, misconceptions <coughs> and then address those misconceptions about evolutionary psychology? Sure, that's a great question. So uh, in, uh, in one of my previous books, The Consuming Instinct, in the chapter one, I actually list nine of these misconceptions and, and that list continues to grow. So I'll mention a few. So for example, there is uh, something called the human reticence effect, which basically is a cognitive, if not emotional bias, which accepts that evolution is valuable in explaining the behavior of every single species on earth except one called humans right don't you dare say that evolution can explain human behavior that's what we are human therefore we transcend our biology dr sad what are you some kind of nazi right so mm -hmm. evolution explains the mosquitoes behavior evolution explains the llama's behavior, the dog's behavior, the zebra's behavior, but surely not human behavior. That's disgusting. That's insane, right? Uh, so that would be one. Of course, some will accept that evolution matters to humans, but it stops at the neck. So yes, evolution explains why we have opposable thumbs. Yes, evolution explains why your lungs have evolved to be the way they are. But don't you dare say that evolution has been used to develop the most important organ in your personhood, which is your mind, your brain. And so that would be one set of uh, misconceptions. Another one would be what's called biological determinism, uh, where people think that if you argue that something is evolutionary based, that means we become simply robotic executors of our genes. We don't have any free will, so to speak. We are just these robots that, as I said, execute our you know, biological imperatives. That's complete idiocy because the the correct position is that we we are an interaction between our genes and our environments right even genes themselves are turned on or off as a function of environmental inputs so let me give you a specific example there might be a universal desire for men to seek social status because around the world women prefer men who have high social status but the way different men go about achieving social status is completely different. Some of us might become famous soccer players. Others will become businessmen. Some of us will become famous professors. Some of us will become great painters. So there isn't a singular way to instantiate, instantiate the universal desire to seek social status. So biological determinism is a complete canard. Anybody who argues about biological determinism, they're simply advertising I'm an idiot who doesn't know anything about biology. But the one that angers me the most is one that I kind of referred to when I discussed nomological networks of cumulative evidence. The 
there's one set of detractors that really upset me because they are actually fellow academics and fellow scientists who say, oh, you know, evolutionary psychologists, you just come up with these unfalsifiable, just so stories, right? Basically, you know, we, we just sit around our study, smoking a pipe, drinking a cognac, and we just come up with, you know, post hoc bullshit. When the reality is, it's the exact opposite, meaning that the epistemological evidentiary threshold that we set before we accept that something is an evolutionary adaptation is extraordinarily higher than the other sciences. And the way we do it is exactly how I argued earlier. You build these nomological networks of cumulative evidence. If I want to prove to you that the hourglass preference that men hold for women is an evolved preference, I'm not just going to pontificate while smoking a pipe. I'm going to show you so much data that supports that. So that's probably the one criticism of evolutionary psychology that upsets me the most because it comes from otherwise supposedly smart academics. And um, for those who want to follow your path, um, what would you suggest a, a good area to explore in evolutionary psychology? So I think one of the wonderful new sort of fertile areas for mm -hmm. budding evolutionary psychologists is, and I actually, I just published a paper that's coming out in evolutionary behavioral sciences, uh, the, the next issue on the sort of future of evolutionary psychology. So it speaks to your question, is I think there are great opportunities now for people to apply evolutionary psychology in different applied disciplines. So in my case, being housed in the business school, I apply it in studying consumer behavior. Now I define consumer behavior very broadly. It's not just consuming Coca-Cola and Starbucks. We consume friendships, we consume religious narratives, we consume marriages. So everything is consumatory. But in my case, I'm trying to Darwinize the business school. I'm basically trying to demonstrate that you can't study employee behavior or employer behavior or uh, trader behavior or consumer behavior without recognizing that all of these agents are biological agents that are shaped by evolutionary processes. So in my case, I'm applying it at the business school. But in every possible area, there's now a growing number of law scholars, legal scholars, who are trying to incorporate evolutionary thinking within an understanding of the law. There is now a growing number of folks who are applying evolutionary thinking in medicine. Now, you would have thought that, oh, well, in medicine, surely they use evolution. They don't, right? So my good friend, Randy Nesse, who is the pioneer of, he's a psychiatrist by training. He is trying to incorporate within the curriculum of medical schools at least one course on evolution, basically asking why would the body have evolved to respond this way and so on which is not how physicians are trained. And so I think there are great opportunities for people, irrespective of the field that you are interested in. For example, you're interested in political science. There is now a field called biopolitics, where you apply biological principles and studying political science. So I think really that's the next big frontier is to take these foundational evolutionary principles and use them in different applied areas. And um, Dr. Saad, how do you relax? What's your distressing outlet? <laughs> well, uh, I love to spend time with the, my family. Uh, I always say that they are my solace in a, in a sense. I go out into the world. I'm engaged with a million people. Everybody is gnawing at me, pulling at me, asking me, making requests. Then when I'm with my family, there is inner peace. I'm with my children. I'm with my wife. Until recently, I'm with my Belgian shepherds. They've, they've passed away now. We're looking to get the next generation of sad Belgian shepherds. And so I really, really, I'm actually a very strong family person. I, you know, I'm not someone who likes to go out a lot and so on. So that's one way. I like to read, although when I read, it doesn't necessarily always get me away from the stuff that I fight about because I don't read fiction to, 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 to a fault. It's, it's, it's something that I wish I could change. So I end up reading a lot of serious nonfiction, which oftentimes doesn't relax me. I like to exercise a lot, even though you may not think so, given that I'm carrying extra weight. I, that's probably my meditation, and it's simply to get on a bike or get on a treadmill and you know expend some energy for an hour. So maybe exercise, reading, and family are probably the top three things. Mm -hmm. And what do you think you would be doing if you didn't work as a psychologist? 
so before I uh, became a professor, my goal was to first be a professional soccer player, which I was a very competitive soccer player, and then to go into academia. So I suspect that if I I would either be involved somehow in soccer, my soccer career ended because of a career ending injury, but I would either be involved in something in soccer or in another area of academia. You know, I was a computer science major in my undergrad and a math major. So if I, if I didn't go into behavioral sciences and psychology, I think I would have still been an academic. But if you told me, no, 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 you can't use as an answer to be a professor, then I think I would, have, I would want to be doing something creative. In other words, I, I always tell people, I receive a million emails from people, you know, what should I do, Dr. Saad? What should I be? What profession should I pursue? And I always tell them, of course, pursue something that you are passionate about. But I think creative fields where you are creating things is really what I respect the most. An architect creates a building. He or she alters the landscape. A, a, an engineer creates a bridge. A chef creates a beautiful dish, which for a few minutes I can, you know, experience great pleasure at consuming it. I create ideas and knowledge. I have conversations with wonderful guests, uh, hosts such as yourself. So I would have to find a way to be creative. I'm not someone who could have ever flourished, you know, being a bean counter, an accountant, uh, a manager, because I need to create. I have the creative impulse. And so maybe a chef, if you told me, don't be a professor, maybe a chef or something of that type where I'm being creative. And finally, Dr. Saad, um, what else is in the pipeline? So uh, I have, I'm currently on sabbatical, but very busy doing the you know, promotion of this book. Uh, I have a huge stack of ongoing projects. Some are 10 years old that I never finished. Some are two years old. So I'd love to reduce that stack because I'm always stressed that these you know, nice projects haven't yet seen the light of day. And I'm already, although I'm not ready to talk about it, I'm already thinking about the next book which will be in a completely different area. It won't be about the culture wars. And so I'm already writing the book perspectives for that project. Cool. Um, anyways, um, thank you for sharing to us um, a snippet of your book. Um, and I'll put the link um, on the description box so anyone could get, could get a copy of your book. Um, it's been an insightful conversation with you, Dr. Saad, but unfortunately our time is up. Um, again, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. I look forward to hearing about your next book and also the rest of what you're doing thank you so much for your hospitable hosting i really enjoyed our chat cheers <laughs>